This photographer's reassessment of why and how we take street photos has made an impact on the genre for nearly 100 years. He recontextualized how documentary photography was created and displayed in a way that forced viewers to rethink how they relate to subjects of documentary work, invented new ways to capture candid images of people that displayed the true nature of life in 1930s New York, and laid the groundwork for specific types of street photos that are still created to this day. His photos of textures, window dressings, and architecture throughout the United States during the Great Depression take viewers back to how the country looked at the time and have been highly influential to street photography ever since. This is Street Smarts Volume 21, Walker Evans. Walker Evans was born in 1903 and spent his youth in the Midwestern United States between St. Louis, Toledo, and Chicago before moving to New York City. Growing up, he was infatuated with literature, which would later inform some of his observations about photography and how he interacted with it. After having a variety of experiences in his young adult life that would help develop his artistic skills and worldview, including a year in Paris studying French literature, he returned to America and began to work in a public library where he would make connections in New York's literary and art scene. In 1928, he picked up photography for the first time. The connections he made would lead into his first professional work that included photos he took of the Brooklyn Bridge that were part of a poetry book titled The Bridge by Hart Kane in 1930, and a series of Victorian house photos that were sponsored by writer Lincoln Kerstein. The ties between Evans and literature would continue to play a part in his photography career throughout, and in some ways had a major role in allowing his first big project to be completed. A trip to Cuba in 1933 informed what was to come from Walker Evans' photography and future projects, in terms of his style and how he chose to represent the people and places that he photographed. This short era of his life also shows how his influences, firsthand and otherwise, played a role in his development as a photographer. At this time, he developed his skills through the use of different cameras and formats to create close-up portraits and wide-angle environment shots. These photos also put on display how he was inspired by the work of French photographer Eugène Adjé, who created work of his day-to-day -day environment in a similar fashion, which Evan saw as having a lyrical understanding of the street, trained observation to it, special feeling for patina, eye for revealing detail. The photos were the first major project that Evans was hired to produce, and they were included in a book titled The Crime of Cuba, written by Carlton Beals, that exposed the turbulent times of Havana while the country was under the leadership of President Machado. The book examines how the United States' initial backing of Machado helped his rise to power, which led to hardships faced by Cubans. Although he was elected by an overwhelming majority, he turned into a powerful dictator during his time at the top of Cuba's political system. Disorder ensued while Machado was in office, until the point that he was driven out and forced into exile. The book became a New York Times bestseller, but had little impact on what it was explicitly created to change since Machado's regime had fallen before it was published. It does, however, show how well Evans' photos could be used to support a narrative, which is something he would do at a high level multiple times going forward. Near the end of his one-month stint in Cuba, Evans believed his photos might be confiscated by authorities when he tried to leave the country. Evans' love of literature helped relieve him of these concerns through the connection he made with writer Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway and Evans happened to meet in Cuba, hit it off, and become drinking buddies during their time in the country. There's speculation that this time together also influenced how Evans took his photos and wrote about them. In Evans' words, his experience with Hemingway included drinking every night, he was at loose ends, and he needed a drinking companion, and I filled that role for two weeks. After their time together, Evans gave 46 prints he had made to Hemingway, who hid them in his suitcase before traveling by boat to Key West, Florida. Once there, he left them in storage for Evans to recover at a later date, which Evans apparently never did. Although Evans' original negatives are what appeared in the book, the prints began to hold significance when they were discovered over 25 years later, at the time of Hemingway's death. The examination of the photos and the friendship the two shared during this time in Cuba have caused some who follow the work of each man to consider how they may have impacted each other, since the tone and style of each man's work is similar in some respects.
Walker Evans is one of the many photographers who worked under Roy Stryker at the Farm Security Administration during the Great Depression, with the goal of creating work that was meant to detail how the government was helping improve the lives of every man during the New Deal era that saw many policies passed that were meant to help the rural poor. Stryker was known for providing suggested itineraries to his photographers that were intended to push them to create the kinds of photos he was requested to acquire from the United States government. But Walker Evans chose to stray away from these itineraries and pursue his goal of conveying what American life truly looked like. While he took many portraits throughout this time, he also conveyed what he wanted to by focusing on the byproducts of American culture, by taking photos of windows, billboards, and posters that decorated the day-to-day -day life of Americans. I was going around on my own very freely, wherever I pleased, just documenting the things I saw, that I was interested in. I was all alone most of the time. I wasn't looking for anything. Things were looking for me. In terms of his ability to go around freely, Evans traveled far and wide during this part of his career. He photographed parts of Tennessee, Arkansas, Alabama, South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. He created these photos using a large format 8x10 camera with the goal of making images that were literate, authoritative, and transcendent, and purposefully making note that he never shot with the intent of creating propaganda. I mean never to make photographic statements for the government or anyone in government, no matter how powerful. This is pure record, not propaganda. The value, and, if you like, even the propaganda value for the government lies in the record itself, which in the long run will prove an intelligent and far-sighted thing to have done. No politics whatsoever. The photos from this part of Evans' life can mostly be seen in two projects, American Photographs and Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. The photos from his time in the FSA are what made up the most highly influential achievement of Evans' career in the form of the transcendent photos that he set out to create. The form they came in was a photo book titled American Photographs, which is widely considered one of the most influential books in photography history. It is a complimentary piece that went along with the 1938 MoMA exhibition that was a retrospective of Walker Evans' work to that point. The 87 photos contained within the book were all taken from 1929 to 1936 and were selected by Evans himself many of which were taken during the 18 months he spent working for the FSA. The book is noteworthy because it highlights Evans' ability to create work with a unique voice that includes many different subjects and settings, but these photos come across as still having the same artistic voice. It was also important for helping establish photo books as an art, in terms of photos lending context to one another that work as a unified piece, even if those photos don't altogether work on their own. The text written by Lincoln Kirstein that accompanied the book had this to say about the power of the form of this collective body of work. After looking at these pictures with all their clear, hideous, and beautiful detail, their open insanity and pitiful grandeur, compare this vision of the continent as it is, not as it might be or as it was, with any other coherent vision that we've had since the war. What poet has said as much? What painter has shown as much? Only newspapers, the writers of popular music, the technicians of advertising and radio, have in their blind energy accidentally, fortuitously, evoked for future historians such a powerful monument for our moment. And Evans' work has, in addition, intention, logic, continuity, climax, sense, and perfection. Isn't every human being both a scientist and an artist? And in writing of human experience, isn't there a good deal to be said for recognizing that fact and for using both methods? Evans took time away from working at the FSA to work on another project in the summer of 1936 with writer James Agee. The two had been assigned by Fortune magazine to work together on a project about tenant farmers. Ultimately, the work the two produced together was rejected by Fortune, but it became its own book titled Let Us Now Praise Famous Men that focused on three families in Hale County, Alabama. Through 500 pages of photographs and poetically written descriptions of what the two men saw during their time in Alabama. The original publishing of the book only sold half of its first pressing and was overall unnoticed and unnoteworthy at the time of its release. 
it went on to become incredibly successful in the 1960s. The later significance of this book comes from the fact that it provides insight into the plight of impoverished farmers who were affected by the Great Depression in a way that is unlike anything else covering the same topic. It is considered a revolutionary work of nonfiction because Adji and Evans were not critical or judgmental of the farmers they covered in this book, which was pointedly different from how documenting people in similar conditions would have been covered at that time and before. They also construct arguments that do not give the readers concrete ideals or force viewpoints, bias, and perspective. Instead, they leave readers purposely open to interpretation in a way that forces them to have a dialogue with the fact that there is no right or wrong way to live, judging the situations these families found themselves in at a time when so many were feeling the weight of financial burden is something each reader will have to consider from their own perspective. This is why the camera seems to me, next to unassisted and weaponless consciousness, the central instrument of our time. And is why in turn I feel such rage at its misuse, which has spread so nearly universal a corruption of sight that I know less than a dozen alive whose eyes I can trust even so much as my own. Evans was incredibly influential in the creation of this body of work because it highlights an early form of what many street photographers are obsessed with, the art of going unnoticed and capturing truly candid moments. To create these types of photos, Evans painted any of the chrome parts black on his 35 millimeter context camera, strapped it to his chest underneath his coat, and allowed the lens to poke through between two of the coat's buttons so that it remained unnoticed. The shutter was able to be released by connecting a cable that went from the camera to his hand through the sleeve of the coat. Advancements in photography technology also played a part in making these images possible with more compact cameras and film that was able to capture photos more quickly because of its sensitivity to light. The results are photos of subjects who do not know they're having their photos taken. As a result, these photos have become a time capsule for viewers to look at the fashions, attitudes, and mannerisms of the time in a way that is completely untampered with. According to Evans, the guard is down and the mask is off, which is further revealed in the expressions of many of these portraits that portray feelings of disconnect and boredom that anyone who has used mass transit can connect with in the daydreaming feeling associated with that sort of transportation. This series of portraits was created in the late 1930s in the New York subway system, but they weren't seen until much later. 89 of these photos were released 25 years after they were taken in a book titled Many Are Called, which is a reference to a passage in the Bible that claims many are called, but few are chosen. The title was given to the project because Evans took 600 portraits, but only a limited number were eventually included. Additionally, the many are called aspect is seen through the fact that Walker was indifferent to the age, race, class, and gender of any of the people represented in this project. Many are called had some influence on making the subway or other mass transit a staple of street photography. Bruce Davidson's subway project being another major example of how well a time and place can be encapsulated through mass transit. The shared connection between photographers on New York City's subway system is also seen through the many who have captured photos of the same woman playing accordion that date back all the way to the 1950s. Davidson in 1958, Ralph Crane for Life in 1969, and Leland Babe and Marilyn Miser in the 1970s, until she was once again photographed by Davidson in the 1980s. If you're open to the possibility that new creative processes can present themselves throughout your life and that you can continue to find fun and purpose in a myriad of forms, look to Walker Evans for inspiration. At the age of 70, towards the end of Evans' life, he spent time experimenting with what was groundbreaking technology for the time in the form of a Polaroid SX-70. Evans, along with others including Richard Avedon, Ansel Adams, and Walter Cronkite, received both the camera and unlimited film from Polaroid to use and experiment with. Walker, who was in failing health at the time, would use the camera to create his last photos. The instant results of the camera, which he referred to lovingly as his new toy, brought new life into Walker Evans' creativity, as it became the camera he would work with exclusively until his death. He stated, I feel strangely rejuvenated in response to using the camera. 
the SX-70 took him back to the basics of what he shot on the streets as a young man in Cuba, including portraits, signs, posters, and a variety of miscellaneous items. He proclaimed that nobody should touch a Polaroid until he's over 60, because he believed the processes that took a lifetime to develop were necessary to push the capabilities of a Polaroid camera to its greatest extent. One of his protégés referred to this period of creativity as the strange and wonderful fruit of a late unexpected harvest. That unexpected harvest allowed Walker Evans to remain influential until the end, teaching us to be open-minded about our creativity. Evans had been vocal about his distaste for color photography for the larger part of his life, but gave it a chance through Polaroid film to create new and interesting work. He was skeptical about how seriously he could take this instant format, but gave it a chance and learned to love it. Since his time, a quick Google search will reveal so many Polaroid projects that have been produced and continue to be produced that are either knowingly or unknowingly influenced by Evans to some extent. He was drawn to make valuable work through and through with his innovation and insight. It's easy to see why he's cited as an influence to so many greats and maybe he'll influence you too. Thanks for watching. Until next time, keep developing.